Richard Seskin's latest book, The End of Lawyers, is a provocative work. And that's a fantastic thing because it's jump-started a really insightful conversation that looks at law and where the practice of law is headed, not only here in Canada, but in the UK and in the US. Richard holds a doctorate from Oxford in computers and law, and he serves as a special advisor to a number of significant legal organizations, including the Canadian Bar Association. And it's actually thanks to the Canadian Bar Association that he's here with me today for this webcast. We're looking at the future of law, particularly as it applies to the work of solo practitioners and lawyers working in small firms. Hey, Richard, how are you? I'm well, thanks. I'm going to be objectionable from the get-go because the book, I don't know you tried with intonation, but the book's the end of Laura's question mark. Otherwise, it's probably be the end of my my career exclamation mark. So. <laughs> so we're not declaring it, but we're questioning no, no, if we're this is in fact yes, the end right. of lawyers. Indeed. Well, there's an analogy in your book that made me think a little bit about the fact that I'm in the market for a new pair of shoes. I'm always in the market for a new pair of shoes. And there was a time not so long ago that if I wanted a pair of shoes, I would go to a shoemaker who would craft something just for my feet, a mm. highly indiv individualized and specific piece of work. But that's gone by the wayside. My shoes are mass produced now, no matter how lovely they are. Is there, there really, you're seeing a parallel between this idea and legal work? Yeah, I say it, rather than mass productions, mass customization is one of the phrases that's often used. Because what we have in mind is the fundamental premise is that quite a lot of legal work is quite routine and repetitive. And that we don't need to deliver it in the handcrafted, uh, bespoke way, but we can actually standardize or indeed systematize. So that might be, for example, the production of documents. This is an interesting year because it's the 30th anniversary of a technology called automatic document assembly. And that's a technology which allows you simply to answer a series of questions on screen and out will come a fairly polished first draft of a document. That technology has been around for 30 years now. hasn't been embraced by the profession, but it's technically possible. And I see, whether it be the production of documents, the offering of advice or guidance, many other legal diagnostic tasks, that actually we can standardize and systematize these tasks. And I know it sounds science fictional to many, but we've seen it in medicine, we've seen it in so many other sectors, so why not in law? And so the question I'm asking in the book is basically, are there different ways of working? To what extent can we actually introduce these kinds of techniques to the legal world? Why should we think, as lawyers, we're immune from technology where it seems to be affecting all other sectors? And that's really, that's really what I... I want to say to the profession that we should at least keep an open mind and think, might we work differently? So is this what you're getting at when you use the, the phrase disruptive legal technologies? Disruptive, there's a distinction in the, it actually comes from a, um, a very well-known book called The Innovator's Dilemma by a, a Harvard business professor called Clayton Christensen. And his book, he distinguishes between disruptive and sustaining technologies. Uh, sustaining technology is a technology that supports the way a business works, or perhaps the way a, a market or an industry operates. Whereas a disruptive technology is a technology that comes along and fundamentally challenges the way a business works or a, or a market functions. So for example, for a Kodak tech, uh, the, the camera people, uh, digital technology was fundamentally disruptive. They were, their whole commitment and expertise was in the whole area of film-based uh, camera technology. But eventually they moved, as some, indeed most uh, market leaders have to, to adopt the disruptive technology. And the, the Christensen question is, or the observation he makes, is that in some sectors, market leaders fail to recognize until it's too late that the disruption that's going on in their market. They'll say of an innovation, oh, it doesn't apply to us. It, it's trivializing the area of my clients don't really want it. It's not going to work in our market. Like the talkies after years of silent film, right? In, who, indeed, who yes. Who wants that? Who on earth wants to hear actors talk? Warner said that in the early 20s. Absolutely. So it's, it's the same concept. And by the time you, you turn around, you see, actually, there's new players in the market, new ways of delivering. That's the, that's the potential threat to the, to the legal market. I'm saying to lawyers, actually, there might be new and different ways of working because of the emerging technologies. And if you put yourself in the shoes of, of a small firm practitioner, you must be able to empathize that whole idea of, you know, I have a brilliant reputation, I, my clients, you know, report high satisfaction with the work I'm doing, why in the heck would I tinker with this? 